We made it, finally, better late than never. Good evening and welcome to the ASV's first Astro Talk for 2023. Tonight we will pre be presented with a talk by astrophysicist Steffi Bernard, who finally decided to grace us with her presence. Only 15 minutes late, it's okay. I won't let her live it down. But before we begin, I'd like to say that in the spirit of reconciliation, the Astronomical Society of Victoria acknowledges the traditional custodians of country throughout Australia and their connections to the land, sea and community. We pay our respect to their elders past and present and extend that respect to all Aboriginal and Torres Strait Islander people today. Now, just quickly as well, um, I'm going to make you wait now. A few more, a uh, few notes on upcoming events for this year for the first few months. On the 18th of March, we have the Messier Star Party. Tickets for members and the public will be available tomorrow, from tomorrow. So you'll see a link posted on our social medias and for the members, it'll be emailed through to you uh, and on our members section of the website. Uh, we have a public viewing night coming up in late, Corf uh, late Feb at Caulfield um, and the 100th anniversary dinner on March 4th for members. Tickets for that will also be on sale tomorrow and the first 99, not 100, but the first 99 people who book, members who book, will get a gold coin, oh, sorry, not a coin, it's a silver coin, centenary coin. One of those, the one one coin that misses it off being in the 100 is going to the historical section um, so that we have a memento for the future. So a wonderful reason to book to come to the centenary dinner for our members. Now, Steffi Bernard, or Astro Steph, is an astrophysicist, astronomy, astronomy communicator and educator based at the University of Melbourne. She teaches undergraduate astronomy and astrophysics and is, a very keen, and is very keen on introducing her students to observing different objects in the universe. I should know this off by heart. We introduce each other so often. Uh, using telescopes all around Australia and the world, her research is on using the Hubble Space Telescope to look for the earliest galaxies that formed in the universe getting back to only 500 million years after the Big Bang and to start to observe some of the properties of these very young galaxies. In this presentation, Steffi will discuss how we find the first galaxies that formed in the universe during the Dark Ages, or its Dark Ages, not the Dark Ages, might have felt like it, uh, why we want to and why does the Earth make it really hard to look for them. Steffi will tell you all about our efforts to look for these distant galaxies and how we use space telescopes like Hubble and the James Webb Space Telescope to find them and begin to work out their properties for the first time. Steffi, welcome. Thank you for finally making it. <laughs> I will hand the microphone over to you and you can get your presentation underway. Thank you, everyone. Thank you for waiting while I got stuck in traffic. Melbourne has so many different streets these days after COVID, and I was not expecting it. So we're here now, though. I'd like to acknowledge the traditional owners of the land in which I live and work, the Wundere people and the Burung, Bunwurrung people, and pay my respects to their elders past, present, and emerging. Now, I am a PhD student at the University of Melbourne and also the ARC Centre of Excellence for All Sky Astrophysics in Three Dimensions, or Astro 3D, and lots of the work that we are going to be talking about today is a real collaborative effort between astronomers all around Australia and around the world. So I'd just like to pay respects to all of them as well for helping us out. Now, I am at the University of Melbourne in the Astrophysics Group. I also work at the Melbourne Planetarium. So if you come over there, you might see me there. And I work at the Victorian Space Science Education Centre, where I teach um, 
little kids and big kids about what it's like to live on Mars. So that's really exciting. If any of your school teachers love to talk to you about that as well. And Mark and I do the Spaghettification podcast. So if you are interested in any of this stuff, we have loads more information available on there. But let's talk about our universe. Oh, this is new. Anyway, <laughs> let's talk about me for a moment. So why astronomy? Why would someone decide to spend many, many years at university when they don't get paid very well for it? Well, for me, I was really interested in astronomy as a little kid. I um, got my first book of astronomy when I was in year two and I read it cover to cover and cover, broke it, took it in for show and tell, all those sorts of things. And then as I got older, I did work experience at the University of Melbourne in the astrophysics group and got very sad that I still had to do two years of high school before I could actually go to uni and do fun stuff. And since I've done astronomy, I've gotten to go all around the world, basically, to observe. I've got telescopes up in um, Siding Spring Observatory up in New South Wales, uh, one in Chile in the top centre, that is the deck cam, dark energy camera. Um, this one down here, this is Hawaii. These are the Keck telescopes, the largest telescopes on Earth. And for my research, I use space telescopes. I use Hubble to look for objects. And then the Spitzer Space Telescope, which is now sadly decommissioned to actually try and find out some stuff about these galaxies. But we'll get into that later. And as an educator, I love to get dressed up and do fun stuff like this with kids and adults all around. So it's pretty good. I'm happy. <laughs> Now, let's talk about the universe, because that's what you guys are here for. Two things I want you to know about the universe before we go much further. The first is that it's expanding. So all the time, the universe is getting bigger and bigger and bigger. In the 1990s, we discovered that actually that expansion is accelerating. And so we think that it's due to dark energy. But in the early universe, things were a lot different. So we have the speed of light is finite. Does anyone know what the speed of light is? three times 10 to the eight meters per second or 300,000 kilometers per second. So light's pretty fast. Light could go all the way around the earth, I think nine times in one single second, but everything's really far away from each other in the universe. So when we're looking at things that are far away, things like the astronom Andromeda, Astronomer Galaxy, Andromeda Galaxy, 2.5 million light years away. So it takes light 2.5 million years to reach us from the nearest large galaxy. And so, we have this sort of natural time machine built into the universe, which is really useful. It's not useful in some ways because if we want to look at, you know, uh, different parts of the universe the same everywhere, we can't do that. We have to see galaxies as they were in the past, but it does allow us to build up a picture of how the universe has evolved over time, and that's pretty cool. So we've got these two things that are going to be really important for the show, for the talk. <laughs> and so. We have this thing called Hubble's Law, and you guys might be familiar with Hubble's Law. Is anyone familiar with it? Yeah. If you're not, that is great, because that's what this video is going to show us. So when we first started to look at galaxies outside Andromeda, and really it's only since the 1930s that we've known that the Milky Way is not all there is in the universe. And there was a big debate in the 1920s about whether the Milky Way is everything and these patches of nebulosity were actually other galaxies like the Milky Way, or if they were just things inside the Milky Way. And so when we started to get spectra of galaxies and actually figure out what was inside them, we saw that they were moving away from us. And we saw that if you looked at galaxies that were further away and trying to measure the distance to galaxies is really, really hard. So getting accurate distances is tricky, but if you can do it, and you look at things that are further away, we see that they're moving faster. And so that's what this is going to look at. If we are this galaxy up here, this is a video from Castro, which is an old center of excellence, and they made some amazing videos. We see that the galaxies nearby, they move a little bit. The galaxy is really far away. They move a lot because the universe is expanding. There's more space between us and the other galaxies. But it's not that we're at the center of the universe and everything is moving away from us. If we could move to another galaxy and do the same observation, that galaxy would see all the things near it moving slowly, whereas we saw this galaxy moving really fast, they would see the stuff near us moving really fast that we saw slowly. So everything in the universe is moving away from everything else. Now, so I've already said this, but just to reiterate, if we look at objects that are further away, we see them as they were a longer and longer time ago. And 
What do you think the first thing that we can see in the universe might be, or the most distant thing? It would be the Big Bang. So there's going to be a limit to what we can see. And in reality, there's another limit that we'll talk about in a bit. But if we want to see things that are further and further away, it gets really tricky. Everything, as it gets further and further away from us, it's getting fainter and fainter. Just like if my microphone was a candle and I was holding a candle in front of my face, it wouldn't be very safe, but I would feel all of the heat and all of the light from the candle. But if the candle was a kilometer away, it would be hard to see at all, right? If I could detect it. And our galaxies are sort of like that. So we are lucky in that we can see them as they were back in time. And we get this time machine effect. We can look at the universe at different ages and figure out how it evolved. But it is harder and harder to see things the further and further away they are. So how far can we see? This is another Castro video, which I really love. If we have our eyes, our eyes have a really small detecting area. They don't have a very big telescope mirror. And also our brains are amazing, but they don't store up light. So if we use just our eyes, we can see out to the Andromeda galaxy. And has anyone seen the Andromeda galaxy in the sky with your own eyes? Yeah, a few of us. It's hard to see down here, but this time of year it is actually visible. So that's two and a half million light years away that we can see with our own eyes. Those photons that left the galaxy two and a half million years ago before they were humans, they are hitting your eyes after traveling two and a half million years. Now, if we can get a bigger telescope, so we're looking at, you know, 10 centimeters or so consumer grade, we have more collecting area. So we're getting more and more light, but we're still not storing it up. So we can see things a bit further away. We can see something called a quasar or the supermassive black hole at the center of a galaxy of this one, 3C273, which I think is a radio quasar. And that's two and a half billion light years away. So you can see one of those with a small telescope. On the other end of the scale, if we have a really big mirror, we have a CCD that can collect all that light up, we can take long exposures, we can hopefully see all the way out to almost the edge of the universe. This is the Hubble Extreme Deep Field that I'll talk a bit about later. But this is about the deepest image that humans have ever taken. JWST is starting to push into this sort of level now, but we have all sorts of different galaxies in here. And then the first light in the universe, what stops us from seeing the Big Bang, is something called the cosmic microwave background. And this is a radio signal that the Planck telescope has taken an image of. And so this is showing us 380,000 years after the Big Bang, when the universe had cooled enough that light could start to go through the universe rather than light hitting a really hot electron or proton and being moved around and things could suddenly start to go through. And we see the cosmic microwave background. So that's a sort of hard limit on how far back we can see in the universe. So we've got a lot of universe to cover with all of our different telescopes and things in the universe. And so let's try and put all of that information that we've gathered about our universe together. We're gonna to start from the Milky Way because one of the things I really love about the planetarium is that when we're studying astronomy at university, you're sort of thinking about these things more abstractly. You're like, this is a star, a star has these properties, it does this, it lives for this long, etc. A planet is this, it doesn't matter. When you're in the planetarium though, and you look up at the sky, you're like, and you guys would know this really well as well. You're, you're looking at the stars. Humans, we see the universe from here on Earth. So again, our Milky Way is not at the center of the universe, but we're going to act like it is. <laughs> so here's our Milky Way. Let's have a look at the universe from the perspective of the Milky Way. 100,000 light years across is the Milky Way. So it takes light 100,000 years to go from one side to the other. All the stars we see with our own eyes, there are only a few hundred light years away from us. And we're getting to our local group, our local cluster. So all these points are not stars, these are galaxies. Each of them is hundreds of billions of stars and planets. And as we get further and further away, we're now getting to, what, three billion light years away we start to see some structure to the universe. We've got bits where there are more galaxies, bits where there are less galaxies. And that is because dark matter has been around since the beginning of the universe, and it's been affecting how galaxies form. Bits of the universe where there's more stuff, more galaxies, they tend to come together to make galaxy clusters. And here we have the Sloan Digital Sky Survey, the biggest survey of galaxies, because there was a telescope that basically its whole purpose 
was to look for galaxies. Every single night, looked for galaxies, and that's about a million galaxies there. And so you can sort of see, as we go in, we've got brighter areas. So the stuff that's closer to the Milky Way is brighter. But again, that's just because the stuff near the Milky Way is brighter intrinsically, and also it's close, so it's really bright. The stuff that's far away, and now CMB is in the way, but the stuff out here, there was fewer and fewer galaxies because they're really hard to see. So it's hard to see these because they're far away and they're faint. Now, there we go. There's our beautiful universe. One thing I like to do when I do this in the planetarium is what's outside here, all this dark area? We can't see anything. The CMB is our limit of what we can see in the universe. There's no more light. And astronomers, we really like light. It's sort of what we can use. We can't go to a star, take a sample of it. So what I say is we tend to leave this to the theoretical physicists and see what they can come up with for what happened after, before the CMB. All righty. So let's sort of unwrap that video. We're going to take all of that data from all different time periods in the universe. And now, rather than starting from the Milky Way and going out, we're going to go from the Big Bang and go this way. This is a timeline. So we are at the very end there, the bell shape. That's us. All the galaxies that we see in the local universe, they're really evolved. Some of them are really big. Some of them are elliptical galaxies. Some of them are smaller. They're Milky Way sort of spirals. And some of them are tiny, little irregular sort of galaxies. And so if we look at galaxies that are further away, we're seeing them as they were earlier in time. And so they start to get smaller and smaller. They get different sorts of stars in them. And the galaxies themselves are different sorts of shapes. We don't have as many elliptical galaxies. We have more irregular galaxies, more spiral galaxies. And eventually, we get to the point where there's no galaxies. We also have a part of the universe here where there was no stars. And if there's no stars, then there's no light. So we call this the Dark Ages. We get the first stars turning on around 100 million years after the Big Bang, and then we get light in the universe. Now, the universe was full of hydrogen. Probably not a surprise to all of you. Hydrogen is about 75% of all of the stuff that we think of as um, baryons or not dark matter, not dark energy. <laughs> and hydrogen really loves to absorb light because hydrogen is just one proton, just one electron. I'll come back to this later. But all this gas here started to soak up all of this light. And so those first stars, it's still pretty hard to see them because all the light that they're emitting is being soaked up by hydrogen. It's not until there were lots and lots of stars forming the first galaxies that actually light could spread throughout the universe and we can see things clearly. That's what happens around the end of a billion years after the Big Bang. And that's called reionization. So we'll come back to that again later. I'm gonna take a break. Okay, so looking for galaxies in the early universe, they are distant. Not great. They're really, really faint. They're really small physically as well because they've only had a little bit of time to actually form. Galaxies form by merging smaller galaxies into bigger galaxies like the Milky Way. So these are all those small little bits before they all merge together. So we do have a bit of a trick in the early universe. And as you look further and further out, things look smaller and smaller and smaller, just like if you had a ball coming towards you when it's far away, the ball's going to look small. As it gets closer to your face, it's going to look pretty big. So same goes for things in the universe. Galaxies look smaller and smaller and smaller and smaller as they get further away from us. But because the universe has been expanding at different rates at different times, things actually start to look bigger and bigger again. So something that's at about a billion years after the Big Bang might look the same size as something that's only 3 billion years away from us, which is really mind-bending. I can talk about them more later. The angular diameter turnover, really weird part of the universe. But in general, these things are really small. And they're really rare. There just aren't that many of them. It takes time for stars and galaxies to build up. And so if we're looking at galaxies in the first few hundred million years of the universe, there's not that many of them. So if we have a Hubble image like the one on this slide, we might have 2,000 sources. And sources is anything that's in the image. These stars beautiful star here, their sources, these big galaxies, their sources, but they're not the ones we're interested in. Other people are interested in them, and so this data does double duty in helping us to find out about stars as well as galaxies in the nearby universe and galaxies far away. 
But what we're, we're interested in is the, the really, really tiny things. You guys may not even be able to see them, but these tiny, tiny red things, they're what we're looking for when we're looking for galaxies in the distant universe. And we were lucky if we find one of them in one of these Hubble images. So we need to take lots and lots of images to find a good sample of them because we want to know a big sample of them to get some of an idea of the different sorts of properties they have. If you find one and you find that it has this many stars, well, that's great. But how do we know that the next one we find is going to have that many stars? We need a big sample of them to try and figure this out. So here is our make you guys wake up with a bright white slide. Here is our electromagnetic spectrum. Now, our visual spectrum is just a tiny, tiny part of the overall spectrum. We have loads and loads of different sorts of telescopes that look at different parts of the spectrum. One of the things that makes it difficult to look for these is that the only stuff that really gets through the atmosphere is visible light and radio light. <laughs> Everything else gets blocked by the atmosphere. So there's a huge amount of the whole universe that we can't see from the ground. We need space telescopes to look for them. And these are some of the examples at visible wavelengths and ultraviolet and infrared. So on either sides of this, we have Hubble. It's an amazing telescope. It's been going for, what, 33 years now. I think this year it was about the same length of time between the launch of Sputnik and Hubble as it was between Hubble and now. So Hubble's been around for a really long part of our sort of space exploration era. But we've got other telescopes you may not have heard of before. In the, what we call near infrared, we've got the Spitzer Space Telescope. I'll sort of go this way. Spitzer is one that I use. It is, we call it the dustbin, sort of affectionately. <laughs> now Hubble is about two and a half meters, it's mirror. So sort of distance from here, over to here, big circle. Amazing. Spitzer is about 90 centimeters, so it's much smaller. That means that it doesn't get very good resolution. It does its best though, so we try and use that when we're looking for these galaxies. And now we've also got in the far infrared Herschel, and Herschel is a, a longer wavelength. We're looking sort of here into the far infrared. This one though doesn't work anymore. So there's lots of space telescopes where they've just run out of stuff that makes them work. So we get as much data from them as we can until they stop working. Once like Hubble, when they're in low Earth orbit, we can send, or well, we used to be able to send shuttles to help fix them. These days we can't. And then some other ones that are a bit interesting for high redshift, what we call early universe stuff, are the ones up here. We've got Fermi, Chandra, and Swift at the X-ray ultraviolet end. And now galaxies don't usually let off much of this really high energy radiation, but Things like active galactic nuclei, supermassive black holes at the center of the galaxies, they can let off some of these really high energy ones. And so some friends of mine have used things like the Chandra X-ray Observatory to try and find really high energy light from some of these distant black holes. Again, it's really tricky. So here's a bit of a family picture of our space telescopes. There is one missing, which is the James Webb Space Telescope. That's okay, because I will tell you all about it later. Alrighty. So why is Hubble so great? Well, apart from being really old, it's older than I am, <laughs> and having a really big mirror, the fact that it's above the atmosphere means that it can get access to loads of these different um, wavelengths that we can't get from the ground. So things like ultraviolet light and infrared light, we can't see from the ground. So having a telescope up in space is really important for being able to see those sorts of wavelengths. It can do imaging and it can do spectroscopy. Now, imaging is important for finding where things are in the first place. Spectroscopy, looking at all the individual wavelengths of light and seeing how much light is emitted at each of these wavelengths is really useful for figuring out what's inside stuff. So the fact that it can do both is pretty awesome. Alrighty. Now, let's just have a look at some of the beautiful pictures of Hubble. I'm sure many of you have seen these before, but a bit of a history. So. Hubble was a bit of a problem at the very beginning when it was launched. Its mirror was the wrong shape, and it's the wrong shape on the order of, you know, I think less than a millimeter or something. But the fact that it had a spherical mirror rather than a sort of more elliptical one meant that it wasn't in focus. So this is the sort of image that you could get from the ground, and people were like, why do we spend all this money to get a telescope up in the sky when we don't get images that are any better than what we get from the ground? But because it was in low Earth orbit, 
we could send shuttles up to put some extra optics in to fix it. And suddenly we get much better resolution because you guys probably know the atmosphere plays a huge part in the images that we can get from the ground. If the atmosphere is really turbulent, we get really bad images. <laughs> if it's nice and clear, we get really lovely images. But up in space, there's no atmosphere to worry about at all. So we get really, really nice clear images up there, which is another big reason, apart from the extra wavelengths that we can see for why we put space telescopes in space. Now, we've got oh, some views of planets in our solar system. I love this one here of Pluto, because when I was a little kid and Pluto was like, New Horizons hadn't been there, didn't really know anything about it. These are the best images that we could get. This is a few different time images of Pluto with Hubble. These are smoothed out. You might be able to tell these are only a few pixels across, really. That's how tiny Pluto is, even for something like Hubble, which has amazing resolution. And I'm pretty sure this is that heart feature on Pluto that we're all familiar with. We've also got images of Aurora on Saturn, or Jupiter, sorry, and the Great Red Spot. Does anyone remember when Jupiter was pummeled by a comet back in the 90s, Comet Schumacher-Levy 9? This is really exciting for astronomers because we can actually see what happens when an impact occurs. And we've got all these, it just happens to look sort of like a bruise on Jupiter. But of course, it's not a bruise. It's actually different molecules being dragged up from underneath the different parts of the atmosphere and making different colors. But you can see how long it took for Jupiter's cloud system to sort of sort itself out. I think it was a few weeks. Now we've got this beautiful picture of the Eagle Nebula. So we can see stars forming inside our own Milky Way. Each of these little things is only a few light years across. And each of them has a tiny little star in the center of them. So in a few thousand years, those stars will turn on, they'll blow out all of that gas and dust, and this whole object won't be around anymore once those stars turn on. But at the moment, we're at just the right time where we can see this beautiful object. You can see stars inside other galaxies, which I think is amazing. Stars are so tiny in the sort of scheme of the universe but we can see them inside other galaxies. We can look at those individual stars. Some of these stars are really important for telling us how far away galaxies are. If we can find seafood variables, so stars that get brighter and dimmer with a regular rate, we can actually use those to figure out how far away things are. So this is I'm amazing. <laughs> and of course, we've got the biggest things in the universe, galaxy clusters, we use them to find things that are behind them because they act like a huge magnifying glass. Now these galaxies, they are warping space-time, all these ones at the center. So anything behind, that light gets bent around and it gets magnified, or we get more light basically from those objects that would otherwise just go off into space. I've got a video of this later, so if that doesn't make sense, that's okay. <laughs> And there we go, we're finally up to the Hubble Deep Field. Now, 1996, the story behind this is that if you are the director of the Space Telescope Science Institute, which is the institute that runs Hubble, uh, if you're the director, you get a certain amount of time guaranteed each year, which is a pretty big perk. The rest of us, and Maddie is an astronomer here, can <laughs> we have to write proposals, we have to justify every single thing about why we want to do these observations with this particular telescope, why our observations are going to be so amazing, they're going to break science, and <laughs> maybe we'll have a 10% chance of getting funded. Um, so he decided that year to, 1995, to just look at one tiny patch of sky for a week straight, all the time, put into this tiny patch of sky. No stars in that patch of sky, deliberately chosen to be really dark. And everyone thought this was a bit silly. Why are you looking at a blank patch of sky? Why are you spending effectively a huge amount of money to do this? And what we saw was that that blank patch of sky had a huge amount of stuff in it, 10,000 galaxies in this image. The stars are the ones with the little crosses. And I think there's only about five of them in the image. The rest of this is galaxies and it really changed our view of the universe. Suddenly there's galaxies everywhere. There were more galaxies than we ever thought there were. And it wasn't until we actually took this data that we realized that this is a million seconds of data all smushed into one image. And with this, this is optical imaging. And with this, we can see galaxies out to a billion years after the Big Bang. And again, we're looking for these tiny, tiny things in this image, all of this beautiful stuff it's just in the way, really, when we're looking at things in the different distant universe. It's very, very annoying. 
And so just to get an idea of how big this patch of sky is, if you take your finger, hold a piece of grain of sand, hold a grain of sand at arm's length, that's the amount of sky that that picture covers. That's how many galaxies are in a tiny patch of sky. We've got the full moon here. The full moon is about half an arc second across, so it covers half of your thumb. And you can see this tiny little box here is what we're actually seeing in this image. It's one hundredth the size of the full moon. And we get 10,000 galaxies. So in our whole universe, there are trillions of galaxies, really, when you do the maths. <laughs> and the other important thing that I haven't really mentioned yet is that because the speed of light is finite, it's 300,000 kilometers a second, if we're looking at things that are further away, it takes light time to get here. And if the universe is expanding, the space between us and galaxies nearby is increasing. That means the light has to stretch or shift its wavelength to catch up. And this is what it looks like. If we are the galaxy on the left, a galaxy on the right is emitting blue light to begin with. Over time, that light gets stretched out. And it becomes red. And so we see this. So I sort of mentioned that those tiny little things that we look for in images like the Hubble Deep Field are red. And that's because they're the most red shifted because everything gets more and more red the further away it gets to us. So when we're looking at things that are really, really distant, the first billion years of the universe, even things that are at ultraviolet wavelengths, let's go this way, ultraviolet wavelengths, so bluer than what we can see with our own eyes, as it goes through the universe, it eventually is at infrared wavelengths, redder than what we can see with our eyes. And that's a problem because infrared light doesn't make it through the atmosphere. So we need those space telescopes that we saw before to help us out. And Hubble is the best one to do this. Now, I told you that hydrogen really likes to absorb light. And this is why. Some lovely plots here. Let's go through them. <laughs> now, hydrogen up the top, we've got one proton, one electron. That electron, usually it's in its ground level. It just wants to stay still. It doesn't want to run around like a kid with a lot of energy. But if it does get some energy, then it can jump up. So usually it's in this ground state. But if it gets a certain amount of energy, it can jump up to one of these other states. And if there's some light from a galaxy behind some hydrogen in the universe, we'll see that there's light. But suddenly, that light will disappear at particular wavelengths. And the rest of the light will keep coming through. And so we get particular wavelengths where light is missing from the spectrum. So we've got Lyman Alpha is the main one at ultraviolet wavelengths, 12, 16 angstroms or 122 nanometers. We've got a few others as well. Once we get to this point, which we call the Lyman limit, there's so much energy for the hydrogen that that electron just pops off. It goes and does its own thing. The hydrogen is now ionized. We've just got a proton and an electron on their own. And oh, now, because the universe is expanding, light is being redshifted, these different wavelengths, they change. If we have some hydrogen, hmm, some hydrogen here and some hydrogen, some hydrogen here and some hydrogen. Okay, some here. <laughs> Okay, if I'm a galaxy with some light, I'm spreading out all my light to the universe, I get to here. My Lyman alpha photons with particular energy, they get absorbed. Now I've got slightly less light coming through, but my light is expanding, it's redshifting. So now we get to this, this piece of gas here. This is a, a bigger piece of gas, it's stronger. So it's gonna be a different wavelength that gets absorbed than the original one. So if we saw different, wavelengths of light disappearing from our spectrum, we can figure out where things in the, are in the universe. We can figure out how much gas is between us and the galaxy by looking at the spectrum. Yeah. And so when we put it together into a very nice movie, it looks something like this. Now I'm, okay, now this is backwards. So the galaxy now is over this way. The light is gonna come out this way. All of these little Traily bits, these are bits of hydrogen gas in the universe. So that light is going to travel through the hydrogen as it gets to us. And then this is the spectrum that we see. We've got the wavelength of light from shortest to longest over here. 
This is the bluer light. This is the redder light. This peak here, this is that Lyman alpha. This is those electrons that are getting excited from the ground level up to the first excited state. And now, as the light travels through, let's see what happens. We'll watch this a couple of times. So I'll just let you watch it first. Okay, so before I play it, let's talk about this line. This is the light that the star, the galaxy was originally emitting. It was originally over here, but the expansion of space has shifted it over here. So when we observe it, we can use how much this line has shifted to figure out how far away the galaxy is. All these little lines, those are those Lyman alpha photons being absorbed out of the light. And you can see that they happened at different wavelengths depending on how far away the gas cloud was from the galaxy. So let's watch one more time. So we've got our first really close gas bits. They take away this light close to the original light. And then as it gets further and further away, this light, can you see that the um, absorption is always happening at 1200 angstroms? So as this stretches out, the light that has the exact right wavelength to excite the gas is always at this particular wavelength. We've got these ones over here. They were from those other energy transmissions transitions that I didn't talk about, so you don't have to worry about those. But what we get is, when we look at a distant galaxy, we see uninterrupted light over this way, very much interrupted light at the blue end, and that's where the gas is absorbing all the light. And we use the amount of light that has been absorbed here to figure out how far away galaxies are. We do it in a very simple way. It's really hard to get a spectrum of every single tiny, tiny different galaxy. So we use imaging to do this as sort of a, a bit of a cheap way of doing it. What I've got here, this gray line is now that galaxy spectrum. It's a little bit less high resolution now. All of these different colored lines, these are different Hubble filters. So we've got 400 nanometer light up here, blue end, and we've got red light here, and we're going out into the near infrared down here. And these images down here, they are the corresponding image for each of those different filters. So we've got our blue image here, uh, another green, yellow, red, another red, and then into the infrared for the last four. So now we're gonna go really, really distant with our galaxy. We're starting now around one and a half to two billion years after the Big Bang. We're gonna get closer and closer to the Big Bang in this video. Okay, so what you might have seen is that this spectrum, as it gets shifted over and over to the red, all of the stuff that was around where that Lyman break or Lyman limit was, gets less and less and less, but this stuff out on the red side doesn't get changed at all. And so eventually there's so much hydrogen around that the universe is just full of hydrogen and it is absorbing all of the light that is shorter wavelength or higher energy then this Lyman alpha, or 1216 angstroms. And so what we see in the images is that it disappears from the image. There's no light in that filter anymore. And as we get further and further away from us, we get more and more filters where we don't see the image at all. So let's watch it one more time. So as we get to around 500 million years after the Big Bang, we only see the galaxy in these very reddest infrared images with Hubble. So you can't see this from the ground. You can only see it with space telescopes. But to find these galaxies at the very edge of the universe, you need infrared light with space telescopes. It just doesn't work any other way. And now if we take all those different galaxies, we split them out into different time periods, we end up with something like this. We've got the really distant stuff here. Can you all see that that is the small stuff in the image? We've got the stuff that's sort of in the middle. This is all of the galaxies, really. And then we've got the younger stuff. There's less of the younger stuff as well. And that's just because we're seeing a smaller part of the universe in those images 
of the close by stuff. So there's just fewer things for us to pick up in a smaller area. Down here at the very end, we're seeing fewer objects because, again, they're still forming. There's not that many of them to begin with. Alrighty, and now this is that reionization thing where we've got gas filling up the whole universe. And so as the light from these first stars, it gets absorbed by the gas, it starts to actually make the universe transparent. We've got an opaque universe where we've got hydrogen with the proton and the electron together. But as these first stars and galaxies start to make lots and lots of ultraviolet light, they start to break apart the proton and the electron into two little bits and light can pass through. So this is again something that we really want to figure out with these galaxies and a reason why we want to find them. I'm going to sort of leave that there. If you want to know more about reionization, you can ask me afterwards. Okay, so now if we take our timeline of the universe again, and we're going to squish all the, <laughs> we're going to squish all the like modern stuff up to this end because we don't care about that when we're looking at high redshift or the distant universe. We've got the Hubble Deep Field, which is optical imaging. With that, we can see out to a billion years after the Big Bang. With the Hubble Ultra Deep Field, which had infrared imaging, we can see to about 700 million years after the Big Bang. And we're just sort of getting into this first galaxies sort of part of the universe where the first stars, there's enough of them that you can start to call it a galaxy, basically. But still not quite there with even the best Hubble imaging. Okay, so this is a picture of the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. This one, it looks a little bit different. It's got more imaging into it, basically. So we've got different colours and things. The stars look a bit different. We've got the red star images this way and the blue ones this way. That's all that's happening there. And with this, we can see even more, it might be a bit hard for you guys to tell, but there are even more little tiny, tiny bits in here. Because when we look at these deeper and deeper infrared wavelengths, we can see more and more stuff in the universe. So with this, this is now the last upgrade that Hubble can have, was actually putting this infrared camera on. And so this has been about 13 years now. When I started my PhD, it was only about six years <laughs> since this camera had been installed. So we were sort of some of the first data that was really taking a big advantage of it to look for these galaxies. And what we started to see was pretty amazing. There we go. <laughs> so with this, even just a couple of years after the first images with this new camera, we started to be able to find the most distant galaxies. These are the first two that were discovered in the first 500 million years after the Big Bang. This is only 400 million years after the first star started to form. So this is really, really, like really <laughs> tricky stuff. You can maybe tell that these galaxies, again, they're only a few pixels across, so they're really, really, really tiny. And what we were finding is that actually they're a lot bigger than we thought galaxies should be. Here's a little zoom in for some scale for you. So we start off at a scale of about tens of degrees, and now we're zooming in till we get to that Hubble Ultra Deep Field. There it is. Now we've got the Hubble Ultra Deep Field. We're going to separate all the galaxies out to their different ages, and then we're going to zoom back in time, basically. So we've zoomed in on the sky, and now we're going into it. And again, you can see all the beautiful stuff that we can actually tell what is happening is in the way. <laughs> and the galaxy that I just showed you, that tiny little black dot, is this red thing. <laughs> they are so tiny, they're so faint, it's so hard to see them. But we started to be able to detect them. Now, with Hubble, we are limited by the different filters that it has. It can go out to 1.6 microns or 1,600 nanometers. But that only gets us to that very ultraviolet part, the really high energy stars in the galaxy. If we want to look at a galaxy properly, we want to see all the stars in it. We want to see those really high energy stars, but we also want to see the normal stars, the stars like our sun. Our sun doesn't emit a huge amount of ultraviolet radiation. It emits mostly at green and yellow wavelengths. 
but we can't see those wavelengths with Hubble. They're so strongly redshifted that they just disappear out of our view. Now, 2021 Christmas, James Webb finally launched. It was meant to launch, you know, 2008 or something. <laughs> uh, and then when I started my PhD, it was meant to launch 2018, and that obviously didn't happen. Um, but eventually it did launch, and it worked perfectly, all of the launch. There are so many different parts on this that executed perfectly to get it into its working state. And now the amazing thing about James Webb is that firstly it has a bigger mirror. So James Webb six and a half meters across. So that's, you know, probably close to the size of this room as a mirror. So big that it had to be made in separate parts because you couldn't get a mirror six and a half meters across into a spaceship to get it up into space. So it had to be built in segments to fold it all up into a space telescope, into a, a space uh, a spaceship, there we go, <laughs> uh, or a rocket. Um, now, the other amazing thing is that it's got redder wavelengths. So while Hubble stopped at 1.6 microns, James Webb goes all the way out into the mid-infrared, all the way out to, I think, 25 microns. I get one off, Maddie, that's good. And that means that we can finally see not just those really, really high energy stars, the young stars, but we can start to see all the other stars as well in these galaxies. And we can even maybe start to see some of the gas and some of the dust, because we want to know how much gas and dust these galaxies we have. We think they have lots of gas because they're still making stars and not very much dust because dust comes when stars die. And they haven't had a lot of time to die, these stars. But so that's now something that we can do with James Webb. And being able to see light that's more and more strongly stretched means that we can see galaxies that are getting closer and closer to the Big Bang, trying to push into that 100 million years to find those first stars that formed in the universe. So what's JWST been doing in its first year? Oh, this is just a visual. So this is what we can see with Hubble. You can see that these galaxies that are 500 million years after the Big Bang, which is the bottom one, we've got one filter, maybe two, with James Webb now. That's what we could see with Hubble. This is the new stuff that's with JWST. And now these 500 million year galaxies, we've got a whole bunch more data and we can push out to more and more distant times, which is awesome. Okay, so this was the first deep field released by JWST. Not the only one, there are definitely ones that are still in process, still being taken. They have to get all stitched together, but this is the first one we started to see really distant things. We've got a galaxy cluster in the middle there that is making all the light from the galaxies behind it get warped. You can see these arcs and they come from, we've got, so we've got light from a distant galaxy that is going out into all around the universe basically. But when it reaches a galaxy cluster, some of that light that would have missed us, it gets bent around just like a big magnifying glass and it hits the Earth. So we see more light from that galaxy, but the light that we see, it looks like it's coming from over here. So we see lots of different images of the same galaxy. So that's what all those arcs are that you're seeing. They're the same galaxy, just stretched around by the magic of relativity. Alrighty, and here was the first distant galaxies in that image. So we've got you can see the distance from us. So the universe is 13.8 billion years old. So this one here is 700 million years after the Big Bang. And we're going further and further away from there. And we can finally get spectra. Hubble can't do spectra of these galaxies very easily. It's got a little bit, but it's really tricky. And no one really bothers with it because it's so hard and you never really get good data with it. But James Webb now can do spectroscopy of these objects. Again, it's still really hard. We're still looking at really tiny, faint things, but it's much better than what we could do. And now you can see hydrogen, oxygen lines in these spectra. So we know that these galaxies had hydrogen and oxygen early in the universe. Probably not surprising, but oxygen wasn't there in the Big Bang. So oxygen had to get made by stars forming and dying to let out their gas into the universe to make more new stars. So that's really exciting. We can see that even in the most distant ones. And this is another spectrum of one of these really, really distant galaxies. In this one, there's some traces of neon. And again, neon takes a bit of time to form in the universe. So finding it there tells us a bit about how stars formed in the early universe, how fast they were going. Maddie and I were just having a discussion earlier where the actual 
height of these lines is probably due to change a little bit with calibration. So the amount of neon is in theory really important because it tells us a bit about how stars formed. The actual number I'm not going to give you <laughs> right now because it's you know still working without the kinks. So but the fact that there is neon there is really exciting. And this is one that was from a few months ago where this is the Hubble image of the same of a cluster. And in this, we could see three different images of the same galaxy that we think. Now, this is what those images look like with Hubble. You can see just how tiny they are. Now, they went and looked at the same images with JWST. And you can see how much better the resolution is. These three different images, in all of them, you can see there are two separate galaxies that you couldn't see with Hubble at all. And the fact that there are two separate galaxies in all of them with the same spacing tells you that it is likely that they are the same galaxy that has been stretched out to make three different images. So that's pretty amazing. Now, this is just a start of what JWST would do. JWST was originally designed to go for five years. We think hopefully it will be taking data for about 10 years. At that point, it will run out of all of these gases that make it work and we won't be able to do it anymore. But that's 10 years of amazing data that we couldn't get before it launched. So it was definitely well worth all of the effort from you know thousands and thousands of people all around the world. Thousands of astronomers working their butts off to get all of this data working. And hopefully in a couple of years, I can come back and do a nice big summary of all the new things we found out about our universe. Thank you, everyone. <laughs> I'm sorry for being so sweaty. It's very warm in here. <laughs> We're working with one microphone. Does anybody have any questions? Barry, any other questions so I know where I'm going next? No? Stephanie, thank you for such a, an interesting talk. I read an article, a news item just this morning. It said that um, astronomers think that there are... Um, more young galaxies than there should be, and that the James Webb telescope's finding too many. Are you aware of that comment and, and its implication? It's sort of something that we were finding with Hubble as well. So we have theories of how the universe formed and how galaxies formed in the early universe based on the amount of dark matter in the universe and how long the universe has been around, sort of adding all this cosmology stuff together. And so that predicts a certain ratio of big galaxies and small galaxies and when I'm talking big galaxies small galaxies what I'm really talking about is the brightness so bright galaxies and faint galaxies it's really hard to find faint galaxies even though they're the most numerous galaxies in the universe they're just so faint that we can't see them very well the only way we really see them is with clusters and so with James Webb something that Maddie told me that I thought was really interesting so Maddie works in Canada on the James Webb Space Telescope looking at supermassive black holes and trying to trying to figure out what sorts of galaxies they're in for sort of the first time <laughs> and um, and the observations that are coming out. There's so many galaxies, you know, they're, rather than, you know, the stuff that's in the way for us, it's more that galaxies are starting to interfere with nearby observations. <laughs> so, yeah, there's a huge amount of galaxies. Whether this is a problem with our theory of how galaxies form and, and evolve, if there are too many, or if it's more just that we're starting to see these fainter ones that we just couldn't see beforehand I think it's going to take a little bit to sort of sort of work out but definitely with the research that I was doing with Hubble we were finding loads more bright galaxies than we expected and for the work that I was doing it was likely that they were nearby galaxies that were just sort of mimicking <laughs> distant galaxies but it's it's really hard to work out sort of exactly how far away these galaxies are so I would expect in a year or so like we'd have better data on that sort of thing and we could actually work out are these really distant galaxies that are more numerous than we expect or is it more like there are some close by ones that are sort of looking like distant ones? <laughs> Do we have any other questions? Oh, we've got a couple here. I'll go here first and we'll jump across. Hi, thank you for this presentation. I just have one quick question. With the lights that's typically coming from stars in, in those deep field images, why is it that the light in that from the stars are actually oriented on polar axes. What's what's the property of the light? Um, that is a great question. I'll go back to the Hubble one because it's easier. No, oh, actually, no. Okay, beautiful. So um, what we can see is that 
with a telescope. If you have a reflecting telescope, you have the light. We'll say this here is our galaxy. That light is coming this way until it hits our mirror. And then it hits the mirror and it bounces off. And so to get all the light into our camera, we have another mirror. So the light comes to the secondary mirror and then it gets directed into the camera. Now you can see here that there are some struts that are holding the secondary mirror in place. So the light, when it comes around, comes in and it bends around these struts. So Hubble has two of them and you get those. Um, uh, no, this is not a good one. <laughs> there we go. So, so you get um, these four ones here from when you have two struts that are um, diffracting what we call the light. And then sometimes you get eight pointed stars, which is when you've got one set of images at one angle and then another set of images at another angle. So those stars overlap. And then James Webb, because it's got those three struts, it has six. Spikes, come on. <laughs> yeah. Okay, there we go. So James Webb has these six main ones and then two others there as well. See, a great question that comes up all the time. <laughs> Another question. Yeah, just a speculation question, if I can, please. Um, uh, you're, you're suggesting in your talk that there was oxygen and neon around in the very early universe. Well, is it possible that's from blue giants with your very short lifespan giving up all that stuff extra early? I have a helper. Thank you, Sadie. So that is an excellent observation. So young star, uh, sorry, really hot stars, which are the ones that are letting out all this ultraviolet light that we're observing, they don't live very long. They've got a huge amount of mass that is pushing down on the core, making everything really, really hot. So all of their chemical reactions or fusion that's happening in the core grows really quickly. So they live very short lives. And so if we're starting forming stars at 100 million years and we're observing them at 500 million years, that's 400 million years where the stars have been evolving, been growing, been dying, all those sort of things. And when the stars die, we think lots of them in the early universe would have become supernovae because we think... I'm not entirely sure. We haven't seen the first stars yet, so we don't know exactly what sort of properties they have. Sort of a bit of a argument <laughs> between people who think the first stars were really, really massive, so 100 times the mass of the sun, which is about the biggest that we see stars in, say, the Tarantula Nebula, which is the most strongly star-forming region we see in a local universe. So we think most of the stars might have been 100 solar masses, or we think they might have been, you know, more... 30 to 40 solar mass stars. So those different sorts of stars make different sorts of supernovae, which make different sorts of elements. So finding some of these signatures of elements in the early universe will help us to actually figure out what sort of stars there were in the really early universe. So that's one of the reasons I'm really excited about all this <laughs> new spectroscopy work that's happening. But yeah, definitely um, an good observation. We have another question. Anybody else got a question? We'll finish up with this last one. Thanks. Uh, just one other quick one, and I'm wondering, so we've explored the electromagnetic spectrum in this variation about how we study the universe. Have there, to your knowledge, been any theories about outside of electromagnetic spectrum, what else might be good senses to figure out what the universe is made of? That's a great question. So we have a few other ways of working out, you know, observing the universe apart from photons or electromagnetic um, waves. One of them is neutrinos. So neutrinos are particles that are electrically neutral. So they pass through things really easily. And so very highly energetic things like supernovae create neutrinos. Now detecting neutrinos is really hard because they don't interact with anything. So you need a huge amount of water essentially to see even just you know, the, the ne mi most nearby supernova that's occurred in modern times, I think we saw about 20 neutrinos from this entire supernova, which is about 100,000 light years away. So trying to find those in the distant universe is very difficult. Another way that people have been looking at, though, is using gravitational waves. So these are ripples in the universe, essentially, where really highly energetic things like black holes merging 
or supernovae or neutron stars merging. Actually, this mass is so big that it starts to make waves in space-time, basically. And so, in theory, you could see these from very distant sources. Um, again, we're really limited there with our actual detectors because these are super, super delicate <laughs> instruments and it takes a lot of time to build them and they're only sensitive to particular sorts of events. So hopefully in the future with more and more of these detectors, we'll be able to actually see the leftover <laughs> universe movements from you know stars that merge in the early universe or black holes merging. Uh, no, that one's looking for dark matter. So this is a Sabre experiment in store. That one's actually looking for, as the Earth is rot orbiting around the Earth, it's orbiting through different parts of the Milky Way. Some ways it's traveling with the Milky Way and six months later it's traveling against the Milky Way. So the Milky Way is orbiting and there's dark matter all around it. And so the idea is that at some time you'll see a signature of dark matter and then uh, six months later, it will be flipped. You'll see event essentially the opposite. Again, I can explain this all later. But um, yeah, so that's looking for dark matter, basically. But again, a very interesting experiment that I'm always happy to hear about when my friends talk about it. Do we have any more questions? No? Well, oh, we do. We have one more. Do you want to run the microphone down? For this young man here, with you. come with me. Come on. <laughs> I've got a shadow tonight. Well, you discussed the uh, acceleration of the universe early on. I just wonder if uh, they need to re-examine the, the, uh, the actual value of the acceleration of the universe regards to type 1 supernovae and the recession of velocity because uh, now with the James Webb telescope, can I be measured that more accurately than I did when the, uh, when the um, accelerated universe was first, uh, first um, um, calculated? So as far as I understand, yeah, so can we get a better uh, measurement of the acceleration of the universe using data we Yep. Yeah. So that's a great question. And so I did my master's on supernovae and supernovae in the distant universe. And one thing that I was like was, how can we don't use Hubble to look for these things? Because Hubble can see further into the universe than we can with, we were using a four meter telescope in Hawaii <laughs> to look for them. And the thing is that because you have such a small field of view, you're really limited when you're looking for supernovae. So supernovae happen about once every galaxy per century. So if you want to see one supernova a year, you look for 100 galaxies. And if you want to look at 100 supernovae, you have to look at a lot of galaxies. So to find enough supernovae to make the measurement that you're talking about, we need lots of them. And this was a Hubble program back in the 1990s where they did use Hubble not to find the supernovae but to follow them up to get really good information about when you're looking at type 1a supernovae, which are supernovae from white dwarfs, basically. And we think that they are constant, essentially, in how bright they get versus how long they are. So if they're brighter, they take longer to evolve, essentially. Um, so getting really good data about how bright they're getting in that transition from, you know, where we see nothing to the brightest part of the supernova to when it's faded away, there's no more light left. Yeah, we used Hubble for that. Now, JWST has the same problem where the field of view is really limited. It's designed to follow things up. It's not designed to find things, really. So I assume that many, many people are going to be using JWST to look at type 1a supernovae and get better measurements. Um, I don't know much more about it than that. <laughs> so in terms of doing an actual survey for these objects, Yes, I am about 95% certain that they will be doing. Yeah, <laughs> yeah. I think with with JWST, 
in terms of finding the most distant type 1a supernovae, which are really important because that is the area where we don't have a lot of data. And also it's the area where if we have different models of our universe, that's where we're going to see the effect. And so I have a feeling that all the ones that we find are going to be sort of serendipitous. We'll be looking at a galaxy and we'll suddenly see a supernova occur. And that's one that we might look into more. But in terms of actually doing a survey for them, I don't know. Yeah, Maddie's nodding your head. So I think it's just such a small field of view that you need a huge amount of time with JWST to get a good sample. Unfortunately, one of the ones where when I found that out, I was like, that doesn't seem very fair. <laughs> All right. Well, thank you. Whoop, I'm going to go this side. Thank you very much for the talk tonight um, and to our audience for the wonderful questions. Now, we have a gift for you. Sadie's going to present you with a bottle of our 100th anniversary port. Yes. Well, there you go. She's a port drinker, Gavin. So, yeah. Um, to our viewers on YouTube and Facebook, thank you for joining us this evening. Uh, it's been great. It's great to be back for another year of talks. I'm going to annoy Maddie and see if we can get her to join us on a stream when she's back in Canada so she can give us a talk on what she's doing with James Webb. Sorry to dump you in that, but you can't say no now on live on. You know? um, and we've got plenty more talks coming up for the rest of this year, some amazing speakers. I know Steffi's talking to Tanya Hill for us to see if she can get Tanya out to do a talk for us. Uh, and as I said, we've got the Messy Star Party tickets going on sale for the public and members tomorrow the centenary dinner tomorrow, tickets on sale, and we have some public viewing nights coming up over the next few months as well. And there will also be some how to use your telescope classes for our members coming up in the next few months as well. So once again, thank you for joining us tonight. Uh, thank you everybody for joining us on the stream and we will see you next month.